Good morning, everybody. Pastor Mike here with another Watchman Pure Bible Study. Revelation chapter 14, verse 1 is where we're going to start, but we're going to be looking at verses 6 and 7 about the everlasting gospel. But let's get the context. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Sion with him and 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder, and I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song. I'd like to hear that. Before the throne and before the beast and the elders, and no man could learn that song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which are not defiled with women. Um, I believe the literal interpretation of that. Go study in Proverbs the strange woman. And you'll understand who that is, that strange woman, Mystery Babylon. And these guys, not defiled by her. They haven't fallen for her ideas and her doctrines and her ways. They've not committed fornication with her. Uh, these are they which are not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and unto the and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, which means that they didn't have a conceited purpose in what they were doing. When when people speak guile and they beguile others, remember the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. Uh, he had an agenda. He had a plan for that. There are many, many, many false teachers, false preachers out there and so on that have, they'll say things that are in contradiction with the Word of God and they have a plan. They have a goal. They have something they want out of that, which is why they beguile others. Usually it's power or it's the name recognition or it's money or whatever it is. Pride is a lot of that. But in their mouth was found no guile, for they are wit, uh, without fault before the throne of God. Now in verse 6, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having, here it is, the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him. For the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. One, two, three, four. There it is. Worship him that made the heaven, the earth, the sea, the fountains of the waters. And we're dealing with the gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The story of Jesus, his, his birth, his life, his sacrificial death, his burial, what he did to, with uh, the spirits in prison. For three days, then he rises again, then he ascends up to the Father. Now he's a mediator between us and God. We're going to talk about the gospel. We're going to talk about this gospel, the everlasting gospel. I was not aware until a few years ago, not very, very long at all, considering, you know, I've been in church most of my life. I was not aware that Bible believing, so called, Teachers, preachers, and people were actually preaching that there is more than one gospel. And I'm hearing this for the first time, and I'm going, uh, where in the world do you get that from? Then I find out that it's related to um, hyper-dispensationalism. Um, there may be other names for it. But that's what it's related to. And it takes the Bible, and these people are very, very arrogant about this. It takes the Bible, chops it up in pieces, and divvies it out throughout history to various groups. And it says that this group here, which we could say is the Gentile believers during the church age, they receive salvation. Their gospel is... Um, without works, by grace, and that's it. But Israel in the last days is, has a different gospel, a gospel that requires them to um, perform works, 
to, um, to never fall away. It requires them to endure to the end in order to be saved and perform works. Where this gospel at this time doesn't require anything like that. And then they go back to the Old Testament and say, Israel of old was saved by keeping the law and by works. And I'm just going, where did they come up with this stuff? And what they did is they piecemeal the Bible. They take little parts that they don't agree with and apply it to different times and different ways and so on. There are varying levels of dispensationalism. Some who have listened to me long enough say, Mike, you're a dispensationalist. You just don't, just don't think you are. When it comes to Israel and God's promises to them, I absolutely, I'm, I'm all for that. I'm not, a, I'm not a replacement theologian. I don't curse Israel by stealing their grace and their blessings away. So I believe that God has things spoken to the nation of Israel and God is going to give them salvation in the last days. I, and I, the typology of this, the plain scriptures of this, to me it's very, very clear that God does have a plan left for his people with whom he foreknew, the Bible says, the natural branches on the olive tree. God has a plan for them. God's going to graft them back in. But to say that God is going to make them endure and do works and that their gospel is a gospel of faith plus works, which those two words don't even belong coming out of the same tongue, all right? That's a fountain putting forth bitter water and sweet at the same time. Doesn't work. To say that Israel, whom, whom is God's real love, not us Gentiles, to say that Israel, God's going to be so mean to Israel that while he offers us salvation without works, he's going to force them to be saved and try to endure to the end. And if they make it, then he'll save them. And I reject that. The Bible, the Bible is clear on that. And when it comes down to, well, we believe there's another gospel. I'm just going, hold on. Time out here. Paul said there wasn't. And Paul said that anybody who brings another gospel, let him be a curse. In fact, let's go to Galatians. Um, this is what the Apostle Paul said. The hyper-dispensationalists, they will take... Um, they will take parts of the New Testament and they'll say that's for us. And other parts of the New Testament like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, all of John's letters in Revelation, Jude, James, Hebrews, 1st, 2nd Peter, those books are not for us. They're for Israel. Here's what I found out. They don't like some things that Jesus said in Matthew 24. They don't like some things that Hebrews teaches. They don't like some things that Peter talks about. So you know what they do? They say, well, that contradicts our doctrine. So therefore, it must not be for us. And they just shovel it off over on Israel. Here's what Paul said. And you either believe, you either believe the Bible or you don't. Here's what it says. He says, I marvel, verse 6, that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Paul specifically in the book of Galatians was referencing a works-based salvation or a works-based gospel. And he's condemning it. He's saying it's wicked. It's not right. Does it belong there? He said, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any... Look at this, look at this. Though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. And right here in Revelation 14, we have an angel preaching the everlasting gospel. And the ultra hyper uh, dispensationalists say the everlasting gospel is a different gospel than the gospel of grace salvation that we have now. It's a different gospel. And if it is, if the everlasting gospel 
is significantly different than the gospel that Paul preached. This poor angel is cursed. And that's what Paul said. It, the wheat or an angel from heaven flying through the air, preaching any other gospel, let him be a curse. And then he says it again. As we said before, so, so I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. This, there's, listen, there's no question in my mind. There is one gospel, one salvation. Jude, I'm just kind of laying out a little case for you. Jude talks about, and, and here again, this is one of the reasons why they don't like the book of Jude. Jude talks about... Um, he said in verse 3, that I found it, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Uh, the very beginning of that verse, beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation. Common salvation. Number one, I like this. Number one, I believe salvation is for the common man. Very, very few high people in this world, rich people in this world, powerful people in this world, very few of them ever even know Jesus. The gospel's for the common man. I love that. Number two, it's common in that it's for you, me, them, they, them over here, they over here. It is for everybody. There is one common salvation. Paul said there is one faith, one baptism, one. And that's what I believe. So I, I do not believe that this everlasting gospel is a different gospel than the one Paul preached because if it is, this angel is accursed and it just, it doesn't, it doesn't work, all right? So let's look at, uh, here's a very quick understanding of what the gospel is all about. Um, he says, this is uh, 1 Corinthians 15, you can turn there. Uh, verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. So here we have the gospel that Paul preaches saves those who do not believe in vain, keep in memory what he preached. He said, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. According to what scriptures? Well, you could say that according to the scriptures of the Old Testament, because that's what it was all about. Everything in the Old Testament was a foreshadowing of Christ and his substitutionary atonement for the sins of mankind. You can see it in the law, the law of sacrifices. You see it in the story of Samson, how he gives his life for the benefit of his people, which is Israel. All right, he destroys his enemies in his death, and that's what Jesus did. In verse 4, he says, And that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Okay, there it is again. By the way, the third day prophecy was in Hosea. After two days, he will revive us, and the third day we shall live, we shall live again in his sight. Um, and then in verse 5, And that he was seen of Cephas, and of the twelve. After that, he was seen of above five hundred brethren at one at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. Then he says in verse 7, After that he was seen of James and all the apostles, and last of all he was seen of me also as, as of one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, and am not me to be called an apostle, but because I pers persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am. So Paul mentions the grace. He mentions Christ dying for the sins of, of everyone. He was buried and then he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Now, I've had some of these hyper people uh, blast me because I believe that Abraham, let's say Moses, David, Solomon, and a whole string of other people in the Old Testament were saved by grace through faith. And people say, well, that's ignorant. Because how can Abraham believe the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and he doesn't and he and it hasn't even happened yet? Well, the only way I know how to answer that is this by faith, Abraham. And God imputed his righteousness to Abraham, not by works, but by faith. And when it comes to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and what Abraham believed, just remember. 
that God himself told Abraham to take his son, his only son, to Mount Moriah, same place where Golgotha is, and offer him there for the burnt offering. And Abraham believed God. And that's a typology of the cross. Isn't it, isn't it neat? So I'm, I'm saying, and no, the Bible says that by faith Moses, by faith Abraham, by faith Isaac, by faith Enoch, and all of these people in the Old Testament received a blessing from God by faith. Even Solomon, even Solomon, because it was sworn to David by God himself that he would never take his mercy away from Solomon, and God never did. So how do I know Solomon's in heaven? Because he's a holy man. Oh no, not by his deeds, but by the mercy of Almighty God. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And at least three books in our Bible were written by Saul, given by inspiration of God. Or, yeah, written by Solomon. There you go. Given by inspiration of God. So there's the gospel that Christ, and, and let's put these two things together. 1 Corinthians 15 describes Christ's death, burial, resurrection for the atonement of mankind's sins. Revelation says that that gospel is everlasting. In what direction? All of them. It's an everlasting gospel. It is from everlasting to everlasting. And God does not change. He does not change. Let's look at this. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. He's the same. Be not carried away, uh, be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines. That's what that is. For it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats, which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. And that's Hebrews, okay? Hebrews is all about the grace of Almighty God. Um, once God makes a promise, once God sends forth his word, it accomplishes exactly what he sent it forth to do. And Jesus is that word, that everlasting word of God. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Um, when it comes to understanding this everlasting gospel. Um, here, here's what I did. I just went through places in the Bible and looked at things or looked for things that were everlasting. Genesis 9:16, when God said the bow, when the bow was going to be in the cloud, it was for an everlasting covenant. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it, that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. So you have to ask yourself, has God ever flooded the entire world since then? The answer is no. And he won't because he made an everlasting covenant with, between God and every living creature that is uh, of all flesh that is upon the earth. God made that covenant and God always keeps his promise. Genesis chapter 17, verse 5. Here's when God changes Abram to Abraham. He says, Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee, and I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee, and I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee in their generations, for an everlasting covenant, to be a God unto thee, and to thy seed after thee. Something to remember is that God made a covenant between him and Abraham, and it was going to be an everlasting covenant. And Paul teaches on this, I think, in the book of Hebrews. Paul says that uh, the law of Mount Sinai and God's covenant with Israel, the law came after Abraham's covenant. And Abraham's covenant, according to, the, according to jurisprudence, that covenant that God made with Abraham supersedes the covenant or precedes the covenant that God made with Israel. The covenant that God made with Israel at Mount Sinai was never intended 
to be everlasting and eternal. Psalm uh, 100, verse 5. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting. Look there. I like this. Um, there's one of my favorite places in the Bible is Psalm 118. And just about every verse ends with, his mercy endureth forever. Just about every one of them. In Psalms, we find out that God's mercy is everlasting. If there's an everlasting gospel, the gospel is how man can receive the blessing and the gift of eternal life even though he's a sinner. How can man do that? He can do that by way of an everlasting gospel that is based upon everlasting mercy. What God promised to David concerning Solomon. He said, if he sin, I will chasten him with the rod and the stripes of men, but my mercy will I not take from him. So as I did Saul. What was the difference between Saul and Solomon? If you look at Solomon's life, you see he had all these women. He was a, he was a drinker. He had parties, he had music, he had wealth. He had power, he had everything that a man could want in this world, and he had like 300 gals that just waited around for him to show up and go to bed with them. So, I mean, and then, because all these wives started bearing down on him, he started building them temples to make them happy, temples to other gods. And yet God said, I'll never take my mercy from him. W what about Saul? Here's the difference. You go study Saul. You'll see that Saul, you never, you never see Saul smoking marijuana, never sees Saul in a bar getting drunk, you never see Saul cussing like a sailor, you never see Saul running around chasing women all day long. That wasn't Saul. However, Saul rejected the word of the Lord. God told him to do something by way of Samuel. Samuel comes back and says, Saul, why didn't you do what I told you to do? And Samuel doesn't say, or excuse me, Saul doesn't say, you know, I'm sorry. Um, I kind of got scared and I, I shouldn't have and I need God's forgiveness. You know what Saul said? I did do what God said. And Samuel said, then why do I hear these sheep bleeding in the background? Why do I hear them going, Bleh. well, I, I saved them for a sacrifice to God. Samuel said, I didn't tell you to save anything for a sacrifice to God. I told you to kill everything. And by the way, who's this guy standing here? Oh, that's the king. I saved him. Yeah. Samuel said, you should have killed him. Because you've rejected the word of the Lord, God has rejected thee from being king. Later on, it says that God took his spirit away from Saul and put an evil spirit over him. Okay. And Saul ends up not hearing from God ever again and consulting with the familiar spirit and then taking his own life the next day. So the difference between Saul and Solomon is Solomon kept God's word. He kept his wisdom, and he writes Ecclesiastes at the end of his life saying, I had it all, it was, a, it, was a, it was nothing. Saul rejected what God said, didn't believe it, and then lied about it and tried to justify himself. That's the difference. God gives us an everlasting gospel that's based upon everlasting mercy. Psalm 103, 17, but the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him. So there is a condition and a requirement on man's parts to receive that everlasting mercy. We must fear him, fear the Lord. That's one of the seven spirits of God, the spirit of the fear of the Lord and his righteousness unto children's children, to such as keep his covenant, and to those that remember his commandments to do them. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you think that mankind now, anybody who wants eternal life, do you think that now they have to keep a covenant with God? I do. God made a covenant with Israel, and he said, if you keep this covenant, then I'll bless you. God makes a covenant with us today the only difference is the requirement of the covenant on our part is faith. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. The requirement of the covenant on our side is faith. We believe, and we keep believing, and we don't walk away from that. We don't reject the word of the Lord. 
God keeps his covenant with us, and it's an everlasting, it's an everlasting covenant. Psalm 112, verse 6, Surely he shall not be moved forever. The righteous shall be in everlasting remembrance. So we have an everlasting gospel that is based upon everlasting mercy um, to those that fear him. His mercy is from everlasting to everlasting, and God will always have an everlasting remembrance of us. He'll never forget us. He'll always remember his covenant. Psalm 119, 142, Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and thy law is truth. So the everlasting gospel, based upon God's everlasting mercy, and it uh, keeps us in everlasting remembrance, and it gives us everlasting righteousness. Isn't that neat? Okay, I like this. I, I enjoyed doing this study. Psalm 119, 144, here we go. The righteousness of thy testimonies is everlasting. Look at that. Give me understanding and I shall live. This book is everlasting. N well, not this exact one, but what I'm talking about is the Word of God itself is, is everlasting, okay? Even if this fades away, which it's on its way, that doesn't mean the gospel is ever going to change or God's Word is ever going to fade away. The, very, the, the gospel is based upon what God promised, a covenant. And if, and if there is no written record of that promise, then people can come along and make up whatever they want to make up. And by the way, they're doing that right now. So the everlasting gospel provides everlasting mercy. It brings us into everlasting remembrance and uh, gives us everlasting righteousness. And it's based upon an everlasting word. I love it. So Isaiah 45. But Israel shall be saved in the Lord with an everlasting salvation. If you ask me, Pastor Mike, what do you believe about salvation? I believe in an everlasting salvation. I sure do. Okay? You shall not be ashamed nor confounded world without end. For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it. He hath established it. He created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord, there is none else. I have not spoken in secret in a dark place of the earth. I said not unto the seed of Jacob, seek ye in me in vain. I, the Lord, speak righteousness. I declare things that are right. So God promises a salvation world without end. He promises that to be an everlasting salvation to those that believe. That's what the Bible says. Isaiah 54 Beautiful, beautiful passage here. They, uh, this is about a woman who can't have a baby, like Sarah and Rachel and Samson's mother and the Shunammite widow, okay? All these women, and Elizabeth, they were all barren. Uh, Hannah, for Samuel, couldn't have a baby. Let's read it. Isaiah 54, 5. For thy maker is thine husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and thy redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. The God of the whole earth shall he be called. For the Lord hath called thee as a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit and a wife of youth. When thou wast refused, saith thy God, for a small moment have I forsaken thee. Let me read that again. For a small moment have I forsaken thee, but with great mercies will I gather thee. In a little wrath I hid my face from thee for a moment, but with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee. Now, it's what I believe. I, I believe that those who receive everlasting righteousness, everlasting gospel, everlasting mercy, everlasting kindness, those people will endure. God will make sure of it that they endure. God does not waste his everlasting mercy and righteousness on people who don't believe him. If you don't believe, you, then obviously you don't want to go to heaven or you think you can go some other way, and God does not make a private deal with anybody. The common salvation goes to everybody, and it's everlasting, and it gives us everlasting kindness. It means that God will never run out of that. And do I believe that they who endure to the end shall be saved? I absolutely do. But I can tell you that over the years, even God has been there aiding and helping my endurance, okay? There's been times 
when I wasn't sure about what was said here. I wasn't sure if I could believe it. Oh, Lord, help my unbelief. And that's exactly what God did. Jeremiah 32, he said, Behold, I will gather them out of all countries, whither I have driven them in mine anger and in my fury and in great wrath. I will bring them again unto this place, and I will cause them to dwell safely. They shall be my people, and I will be their God. And I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for the good of them and of their children after them. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from them to do them good. But I will put my fear in their hearts that they should not depart from me. There it is right there. The, the concept of us enduring and God saving are not mutually exclusive of each other. That's how God works. He promises everlasting righteousness and mercy and salvation and everlasting kindness and everlasting everything. And he gives that to those who endure. But how is it that we endure to the end? God said, I will put my fear in their hearts that they shall not depart from me. Let me tell you, I've seen it. I've seen it all my life. People coming in church, get down to the altar, praying a prayer. They're here for a while, and then they're gone. You know what that means? They didn't fear God. They're not concerned about what's going to happen at the end of their life. They're not concerned that they could draw one last breath and then enter into eternity. They're not concerned about that. They don't care. And I've been in church all my life, and I can say that there's been times when it wasn't easy. And I wanted to bail. I sure did. God put a fear in me. Mike, you know better. Don't do this. Because you know what I can do to you. And I went, God, you're right. I need help. God always helped me. Always. Okay? Everlasting. He's, let me read that again. I will put my fear in their hearts that they shall not depart from me. Yea, I will rejoice over them to do them good, and I will plant them in this land assuredly with my whole heart and with my whole soul. For thus saith the Lord, like as I have brought all this great evil upon this people, so will I bring upon them all the good that I have promised them. Amen. Hebrews 13, verse 20. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Ooh, I like that. It's an everlasting gospel giving us everlasting mercy. It's an everlasting covenant. It brings us into everlasting uh, remembrance. It gives us everlasting salvation and everlasting kindness. And it's made by way of everlasting blood in an everlasting covenant. The blood of Jesus is incorruptible. That's what the everlasting, if the everlasting covenant is based upon something that could fade away, then it's not everlasting, okay? If I, if I built a concrete walled house with a concrete roof on it and concrete walls and concrete doors, and yet I built it, on sand, it's not going to last. And so the everlasting gospel is based upon, and an everlasting covenant is based upon everlasting blood. That's the foundation of it. He said, it will make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And let me read this. This is uh, 29 verses. I like it. It's one of my, one of my favorite places. All right? At, and as I'm reading this, at some point it's going to click in you how long God's mercy endures. Psalm 118. <clears throat> oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, because his mercy endureth forever. Let Israel now say that his mercy endureth forever. Let the house of Aaron now say that his mercy endureth forever. Let them now that fear the Lord say, His mercy endureth forever. 
I called upon the Lord in distress. The Lord answered me and set me in a large place. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear what man can do to me. The Lord taketh my part with them that help me. Therefore shall I see my desire upon them that hate me. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. 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 All nations compass me about, but in the name of the Lord will I destroy them. They compass me about, yea, they compass me about, but in the name of the Lord will I destroy them. They compass me about like bees. They are quenched as the fire of thorns, for in the name of the Lord will I destroy them. Thou hast, let me change my paper here. There we go. Thou hast thrust, thou hast thrust sore at me that I might fall, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and song and has become my salvation. I'm not saving myself, people. No way, no how. The voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tabernacles of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord doeth valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord doeth valiantly. I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. The Lord hath chastened me sore, but he hath not given me over unto death. That's, that's what God told David he was going to do to Solomon. I'm going to, I'm going to beat the snot out of him if he sins but I'll never take my mercy from him. Open to me the gates of righteousness. I will go into them and I will praise the Lord. This gate of the Lord into which the righteous shall enter, I will praise thee, for thou hast heard me and art become my salvation. The stone which the builders refused is become the headstone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. All this stuff you sounds familiar, doesn't it? Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. God is the Lord, which hath showed us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords, even unto the horns of the altar. Thou art my God, and I will praise thee. Thou art my God, and I will exalt thee. O give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. We're sending abound. Grace did much more abound. I believe in the everlasting gospel that gives everlasting mercy and supplies everlasting righteousness and is everlasting kindness to us. I believe in those things. And I even believe in a God that even when I faltered, even when I wasn't sure, even when maybe I wanted to run, God kept his fear in me and I've never departed from the Lord. Don't plan on it either, all right? There's one gospel. There is one gospel. God saves man by grace through faith, through the blood of Jesus Christ. That blood, and again, some would say, well, that's nonsense because all these people lived before Christ died on the cross. The Bible talks about the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. It's everlasting to everlasting. It's what I see. Good to be with you today. Love the Lord. Love his word. Study it. Read it. Think about it. Let God show you what, he, what, he, what his truth is. Let God teach it to you. This is Pastor Mike. I'm going to go eat my lunch now. See you later. Bye-bye.